Okay, excellent. Welcome everyone to this IES webinar, Biodiversity Net Gain and Environmental Net Gain for Remediation Sites. I'm really pleased to be joined by John Davies, who has been Director of RSK Biosensus since 2019. John today will be talking about the use of biodiversity net gain and environmental net gain to shape the right outcomes for remediation projects. As always, after John's presentation, you'll have the opportunity to ask questions, so please do submit these in the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen at any point during the presentation, and I will then read these out on your behalf later on. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the IES website and YouTube channel. Um, if you are watching on our YouTube channel later on, please do subscribe to our channel. Thank you all so much for joining, and thanks, thanks to you, John, for coming on as well. I'll now hand over to you. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Ethne. Thank you very much. Okay, so I uh, are going through. Can you are those working for you, Ethne? Yep, all working. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, so I've got some details there if anyone did want to contact me. Um, let me just change that so that I can see the screen better. Okay, so uh, these are the, 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 the topics I'm going to be covering today. So biodiversity net gain. So I'm an ecologist by background, so I'm, the focus will be on biodiversity net gain. Hope that's all right with everyone. Um, so I'll be talking about that and how it applies to brownfield sites. Then talking about the the kind of the importance of biodiversity on these sites, which isn't always recognised. I want to touch on the, the remediation and, and how that can obviously disrupt biodiversity quite uh, significantly. Then look into the other environmental issues, carbon and uh, access to the countryside, water quality, all that sort of stuff, and the, the benefits we can get from doing interesting habitat restoration on these sites. And then a little bit on uh, this kind of balancing act between when it is appropriate to build on Brownfield and when maybe it's better not to. And then we uh, a couple of case studies if I've got time and then we'll have questions at the end. So I don't know the extent to which you guys are familiar with biodiversity net gain. Uh, this is the, the definition. I won't read that through. You can read it in your own time if you like. But basically, we developers and they are now required by law to uh, when they are developing land that they end up with 10% more biodiversity on the land when they have finished and built their development than when they started which is off, obviously a bit of a, a challenge sometimes um, that has come about through the Environment Act which eventually uh, got royal assent in November of last year and that makes it mandatory in England uh, to achieve this 10% net biodiversity net gain for all development. So it's a real game changer for, for us in our industry. Worth saying that back in 2019, when they were consulting on the Act, um, DEFRA had put forward uh, a potential exemption for brownfield sites. So they were basically saying that if you have a brownfield site that doesn't contain any particularly nice habitat, and that if you were to have to go down the route of BNG, that might make the development on that site unviable because it does cost to do a BNG then you might be exempt and so that I think they were probably lobbied quite heavily um, however <laughs> as far as I can tell from the Environment Act that has now been removed but we still have the secondary legislation to come and who knows it might get stuck in again but there there was it's interesting that there was a discussion about brownfield sites in particular so biodiversity net gain really involves First of all, getting an understanding of what the biodiversity on your site is currently, your baseline. And we do that using habitat survey techniques. Used to be phase one, that's what that drawing is, the old phase one methodology from quite a long time ago. We've got a fancy new one now called um, UK Habs, which is more in, a, in tune with, um, with biodiversity priority habitats and all that sort of stuff. So that's what we tend to use. It's also critically, um, ties in very nicely with the DEFRA biodiversity metric and that's this tool that we use to calculate uh, biodiversity net gain and what the metric does at the start when you've got um, you've got your habitats existing on site before you've done anything it multiplies the, the the total area of each habitat you've got on site by various things in particular it's the distinctiveness of each habitat so that's kind of its rarity and how important it is and also by its condition, because some habitats could be rare habitats, but they're in shocking condition or they could be in really good condition. And that all affects what the uh, the biodiversity score is. And it gives you a figure then of the kind of pre pre construction biodiversity. And it does it gives you this in terms of biodiversity units. 
and that is really a, a proxy for biodiversity value and i say that um with good reason because it's it doesn't include species at all this is very much entirely a habitat based system at the moment so species don't really get a look in but that doesn't mean you shouldn't look at protected species on your site that kind of gets done separately but as far as bng is concerned it's a habitat based thing so having worked out what you've got on site uh, uh, before you start then you've got to work out what you predict to be on site uh, post development obviously and that again is calculated by uh, multiplying the the the, uh, the area and the condition target condition habitat distinctiveness again and this time it's of those habitats you're expecting to to retain or to enhance or to create on site so whatever is left on site once you've built your i don't know housing development or or battery storage facility whatever it is uh, you will have a landscape plan a landscape design that maybe retains stuff around the edges and enhances it but the key thing is for the post development negative multipliers are also applied by this metric so it's a slightly fairly clever metric uh, certainly cleverer than i could have put together uh, and these negative multipliers include the time to reach target conditions so if you're saying you're going to create a habitat it does take time to kind of reach an appropriate level of maturity that it is actually performing as that habitat. Uh, delivery risk is another one. It can be difficult to create these. So certain habitats are harder to create than, than others. And then spatial relevance is um, if, if you are creating this and it's isolated from any other nice batch of habitat, then it's there's more of a, multi, a negative multiplier applied because you're encouraged to try and create habitat that links up existing nice priority habitats, which all makes perfect sense. Uh, yeah, the maths bit is not that complicated, to be honest. I mean, what you're looking at is, is net change. So you want to know whether you've got more 10% more after development than, than there was before. So it's basically the after work by the post development biodiversity units minus the baseline essentially but it takes into account as you can see the spatial risk the time to condition and the delivery risk as well and obviously you do that calculation and if you had 10 biodiversity units on site before then your post development needs to have 11. so it's not rocket science uh, it's fairly straightforward maths and the, the metric does all the calculation for you now it is iterative because it's fairly easy to to run um uh, the metric and, and to change things tweak things in the metric um, so if for example you don't end up with 10 percent 10 percent net gain on the basis of your design then you can redesign it a bit so maybe you you enhance more habitat or you create a bit more or you lose a bit less um you know so is there anything on site that you can do that would create that would increase the biodiversity value so you can get to that magic number of 10 percent net gain if you can't there is also the scope to do uh, habit uh, off-site um, uh, creation uh, and often that involves potentially paying someone else such as us this is what we do uh, rsk wilding for an offset so people like us are creating habitat banks across the country where we are turning um, maybe an arable site into something much more biodiverse. We calculate the number of units that represents, and then we can sell those units to developers who need a bit more to get them to their 10%. So that is that is the way that the, it can be done. So that's BNG in a very rapid nutshell. Uh, just a quick one on the on biodiversity on brownfield land, which you may not be familiar with. It, it, I remember when John Prescott back in the uh, 90s probably, changed development rules slightly so that development on on brownfield was very much um uh, promoted and greenfield was sacrosanct which is a bit daft really because greenfield land is often improved grassland which is really dull or arable which is really dull there's no biodiversity on it whereas brownfield sites can be really nice i'm an entomologist so i know how nice they can be for for bugs and it's really it's a combination of the heterogeneity of the habitats you've got scrub bare ground bits of wetland uh ephemeral grass and all sorts of different habitats which helps but also the low nutrient status of the of the soil because often on brownfield sites you've got rather poor rubbishy soil it's not the sort of thing you'd want to grow for example. and that those two things uh, combine to to create a kind of a, a, a diverse flora and also that leads to lots of invertebrates so it's good for biodiversity because flora and uh, plants and invertebrates are the main part of 
main elements of biodiversity, really. And they can be a refuge uh, for species that are getting rare in the wider environment. So you do tend to get quite interesting species on these sites because bare ground and flower rich ephemeral grass and some of these habitats, you know, if you fly over the UK, it's just a, a patchwork of arable fields really and improved grass from it. We, we do farm the hell out of the landscape. So these, these are little pockets of, of interesting habitat, to be honest, often, not always, but often. And it is worth saying that the longer these sites are left, they do tend to scrub over, uh, so they might lose their value. So the value of these sites is generally in that sort of those those ephemeral habitats that are maybe not around for long. So you, in order to maintain the biodiversity, you would need to manage them a bit uh, so that it doesn't scrub over, get covered with buddleia and that sort of stuff. So contrary to common perception, these, these sites can be really quite nice for, for wildlife. Uh, it's that mosaic of, of, of habitats and that leads to a high species richness and that can be a constraint or an opportunity so it can be a constraint if you're trying to develop on this site but if you can't develop then it's actually an opportunity for enhancing biodiversity and really creating something quite special therefore developing some of these sites can lead to a significant loss of biodiversity they, they vary massively okay from site to site but if you've got a, a really nice variety of habitats, it can be very biodiverse, but equally, if you've got hard standing and, and virtually no vegetation, then the diversity can be very low. So you, you can't make any assumptions. So if you do have a site and it's unsuitable for development for whatever reason, uh, then it's worth noting that this these thin soils does mean that, that your opportunity to create good habitat or enhance what's there is actually quite high and then you could you can actually use these sites therefore rather than building them you can potentially use them to offset if you're a developer you could use and it's your own land you could use it to offset impacts elsewhere on your land holding for example or indeed you could even sell them to other developers who need to buy biodiversity offsets or biodiversity credits so i don't think you should developers should or landowners who have brownfield sites should necessarily see it as a disaster if they've got quite a lot of nice um, potential to create biodiversity on their site so remediation and kind of reinstatement is uh, potentially obviously quite a, a dramatic change for a site obviously um, so we have various reasons health and safety mainly you might be cleaning up a site in order to redevelop it for housing or the environment agency want you to clean it up because there is a, a an impact pathway to a local uh, a nearby river or whatever it is so there are various reasons why you might want um, to remediate a brownfield site and obviously as i said on those areas where biodiversity is pretty high then extensive re remediation which is often you know taking all the soil off uh, and treating it or capping it completely obviously that's going to have a pretty damaging effect on on whatever biodiversity is there so what i'm saying is if you are a landowner with one of these sites if the remediation is going to be very expensive and it often is and you've got an awful lot of biodiversity on site which you'd need to replace through biodiversity net gain then that can very much tip the balance away from development unless that targeted exemption i was talking about comes back but i wouldn't rely on that so it's important to balance these implications of biodiversity net gain and remediation when you're making a decision uh or what to do with the site basically and obviously you know the, the key thing here is is development land is very um valuable so it might well be that if you get enough residential units on the site we've got one in swindon at the moment 300 residential units that's that's going to bring a developer a lot of money so even if you do have to remediate a bit and you have to offset biodiversity that might well be enough but it either way i think these the B and G implications do need to be brought into the into the equation because it, it is it does increase the cost of developing these areas. Now, if you're not developing um, and you you decided that that's a, that's a no go for, for whatever reason, it is worth saying that capping with topsoil and sowing it with a kind of a, a vigorous grass mix, which is sort of the traditional approach, it's expensive and it sort of misses a trick because you're better off actually leaving it to develop into something nice and you might then you know calculate the number of units on site 
beforehand and then maybe do a few interventions which could lead you to increasing biodiversity so it, it would be a, a lower cost and you'd get some benefit from potentially selling the, the so remediation is you know to remediate or not to remediate that is the question as shakespeare once almost wrote okay so it is an investment opportunity biodiversity net gain it's not necessarily a massive constraint we need to be aware of that on our remediation projects restored brownfield land you know can be more more valuable if we if we do that rather than reinstating to agriculture and that's what often happens with with capping you know of landfill sites for example or whatever it is or remediating of sites you just return it to the farmer who grazes some sheep on it but you know it might be a bit more interesting and indeed profitable to create something a bit more interesting than that and just one hectare of of land if you create you know really nice habitat like you've got in the picture there can yield quite a lot of biodiversity units maybe maybe 10 biodiversity units 10 to 20 even so given that the market price for a biodiversity unit is around about 10 grand possibly more in many cases it is more um then that you know that multiplies up so if you've got one hectare and you can turn it from something that's really rubbish maybe arable land into really nice grassland that's worth 100 grand yes it's over 30 years but you know it's a bit of money to to instead to uh, create it and then you leave it to its own devices so it is it is a a, a potentially uh, income producing uh, land use and it's really good for the environment which is great now i've recently been going through the defra consultation on the environment act and biodiversity net gain and uh, one of the things that they're talking about in there is whether you can stack income what that means is if you were to create a habitat in order to get biodiversity credits so you're doing it specifically for bng really there, there it might well be the case in the future that you can actually get income for other things as well so if you could if you can demonstrate you're offsetting uh, you're sequestering a certain amount of carbon or you're fulfilling a role reducing flood risk whatever it is if there's someone who might pay for that then you can get an income from it and so the, the more of these you can do the, the more income you might get from it there's also the possibility that you might do renewables on your land so you can create these habitats and just have a, a, a wind turbine wind turbine or two so that's sort of stacking in a way you're getting an income from the the the, uh, the electricity company but you're also creating habitat so there are various interesting solutions one can come up with and it all varies from from site to site and you know obviously you you will then end up 30 years later with a really nice site and it's you still own it basically and indeed it's naturally remediated what happens after 30 years is quite interesting and we don't really know we don't really know i think what might what's most likely is that you might be able to get a bit of an uplift income after 30 years for retaining it continuing to manage it as nice biodiversity but you know i'll be long retired by then so the other part of the the uh the title of this talk was really about environmental net gain as well as biodiversity so apologies i've really focused on the biodiversity but i am an ecologist so it's my prerogative um but there are all sorts of other benefits of course now everyone is striving to net zero at the minute and there are various interventions you can do the most obvious one is tree planting on a, on a site not not the brownfield sites are great for tree planting because the, the soils aren't, aren't great but you know that's an obvious one for getting carbon offsets but it is worth noting that that various different habitats have been assessed as sequestering carbon as well so there's a, a, a natural england report uh, which helpfully tells us what the sequestration capabilities of different habitats are so you could potentially um demonstrate that the sequestration that you're getting from the wetland you've created or the lowland meadow or whatever it is there's also flood allevi alleviation uh, again brownfield sites aren't great for that because the, the thin soils are often very permeable but if you can create wetland on site that's holding back water and preventing flooding downstream then that's a good thing to do so these are all the kind of environmental benefits you can get from from planning what you do on a remediation site properly and then you've got other benefits as well if you're holding back water and passing it through a, a reed bed then you're cleaning it up before it goes into the water course so various things that we can do you know planting trees is good for air quality and then of course there are societal benefits the kind of the health and well-being benefits of creating natural habitats for people to to go walking in so these are the sorts of things we're talking about um, with these additional benefits and if there is a route to market 
then you can get an income from this. And there are obvious routes to market. And by that, I mean a means by which you get an income. You can get paid for doing this. Biodiversity net gain is an obvious one if you, if you can get a developer to pay you for your biodiversity credits. But then there's carbon offsets as well. And there may be others. Um, and that can equate to actual revenue. So if, for example, the local authority downstream is having a real um, problem with flooding of a local town, if you're doing stuff that is really holding back the water, then you might get a grant from them for doing it. So this can be not just good PR, look at all the great stuff we're doing for the environment, it can actually be profitable, which is good. And that's the sort of stuff that we do uh, in wilding and RSK biosensors is to, to kind of sell something Okay, so um, one of the th one of the new things that's turned up actually back in uh, just in um, twenty twenty one. Sorry, I can't see the top of my screen. Uh, is something called the Environmental Benefits from Nature tool, and this is closely allied to the Defrometric that I was telling you about earlier, which is helpful. And it's a means of kind of quantifying these other additional natural capital or environmental or ecosystem services benefits. So it's quite nifty and quite useful. Uh, I haven't used it myself, but I've got colleagues who have. So I'm going to try and talk you through it. But uh, bear in mind, I'm no expert, so I don't want any complicated questions about it, please. Although I can hopefully go away and I'll answer them um, offline subsequently. So this is a this is. It is voluntary, so it's not something that developers need to do in the way that BNG is. That is mandated by law. But this tool is quite easy to, to run and quite, you know, just quite cheap to get your consultant to do it for you. And it does, I think, provide added value because it, it gives you, it, it demonstrates and quantifies these other additional benefits. And it also encourages you to to design a scheme where you get more of these benefits, not just for, for nature and for the environment, but also for people. And so it's a, a means of, of optimizing the environmental benefits you get from, from any sort of development. And it does that by considering the implications of your land use change uh, across 18 different ecosystem services, which I'll touch on in a minute. And so it can help you design your scheme, uh, tweak it, as I said, in order to, to optimize these additional benefits and it kind of tells you over year one year 10 and year 30 uh, it actually calculates for you what what your the benefits under these different ecosystem services are so if i just take you oh no hold on that's the next slide pardon me um so in the tool there are 40 what are called condition indicators across these 18 ecosystem services i won't go into the detail but the assessment can be carried out to three different levels of basic standard and advanced and that's with increasing numbers of indicators. So if you're doing an advanced, indicators you look at, but also increasing complexity of information. So a basic level, you don't really need lots of detailed information to inform it. It's kind of high level. So you can you can pitch it at different levels basically. And so basic, you know, you, you can be using freely available online maps to get your information to, to fill out the, the tool to, to answer the questions in it. Um, at standard. Uh, level you you'll probably or you may need to go and visit site and collect a bit more data you might need a bit of of detail or well simple gis analysis so it's a bit more involved and it, it, you might want to apply this if the site is quite varied um as opposed to a very simple site that's just arable for example and then advances uh, as you'd expect you definitely need a site survey, all 40 indicators you need to look at, and you will need to provide quite a lot of information for each of them in order for the tool to, to run for you. So with small projects with a limited impact, you might do a biodiversity assessment, and you wouldn't need to look at all of the indicators, so it's pretty high level. We've done um, one of these EBN assessments on a, on a solar scheme. NZIP is a nationally significant infrastructure project, for those that don't know. Uh, so it's quite a big solar farm. Um, and we applied it at the standard level because the habitats weren't very varied. It wasn't a very interesting varied site. Um, uh, and also the client, you know, had didn't have a massive amount of information. So it's that kind of mix of the amount of data available and also the, uh, the, the, the heterogeneity or the interest in the site. But, you know, something that big that is a major project you can do at the advanced level because, uh, you know, you, you can acquire more detail if, if you need to. 
And this is kind of how it works is again, like the defrometric, you calculate the, the total area of the pre-development baseline habitats and you enter that into the tool. And if you've done the defrometric, you have that already. Then you'll do the same for the post-development habitats. These ones that you're either retaining on site or you're enhancing or you're creating. So it could be a mix of all three. And then you also enter data for the, the different condition indicators. So if it's an advanced um, level assessment you're doing, then all 40 condition uh, indicators you'll have to, to enter data. And some of it can be quite detailed and comprehensive. So it varies from basic to advanced. And this is what it looks like. Um, so this is those are the 18 ecosystem services down the left hand side. Uh, and then it basically tells you how you how it would perform in terms of that ecosystem service. Your you to do on your uh, the habitats you might be creating, um, you know, what, what's their post development. So you can see from this, from that top one, that the, a kind of a, a big red down arrow means oops, that's pretty bad. A horizontal one means nothing's really changed. A sort of down to the right arrow in red is it's not great. And obviously the green one is it's quite good. And if it's a, a completely upward green arrow like you've got for recreation, then it's really good. So for this site, um, it was basically being created for recreational benefit and, and enjoyment of the countryside, for example. Uh, and um, so this is kind of the output that you get from from the from the thing, from the uh, from the tool, uh, and the ecosystem. I, just, I can't see this. I really should be able to get rid of that. Um, no, never mind. Um, so the 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 ecosystem service in this example, which had the largest decrease, is food production. As you can see, lots of red arrows, and that's really because it went from being uh, arable to uh, an, a semi-improved grassland basically so that was the change in land use so you're taking a, you're taking the arable out of food production so it's hardly surprising that food production has gone down the swanee uh, but interestingly the tool has an interpretation section that, that can be expanded and that can provide recommendations again it's like that iteration i was telling you about it could basically say oh this looked bad for food production have you thought about you know, including some allotments or some some community orchards, for example. So you, you see how it works. The idea is to, to come up with better environmental outcomes from your development. Here's another example. So this is a this is a site that um, I was proposing for National Grid a while back. So it's a potential um, benefits you can get from land use change. This was all arable. What you, what you can see there was um, under those different colours was arable previously. And so I created a, a biodiversity net gain or a rewilding or a natural capital vision for the, for the site uh, with a view to optimising not just biodiversity, but all sorts of other things. And in this example, we were changing what was nearly all arable land into a variety of different habitats I'll talk about in, the minute, in a minute. And we ran the calculations through the metric and it, it would equate to about four million pounds of uh, biodiversity credits uh, at, at 10k per unit. So not to be sniffed at. See, there are, it would cost you to create the habitat. So there is a, you, you don't just get 4 million and, and you know, jobs are good. Un. So the habitats we're looking at here, I don't know if you can see up in the top, there were two isolated patches of ancient woodland that were just lurking in the middle of an arable field, which is not great. So we proposed creating this new woodland planting to link it all up into a swathe of woodland that's all connected tied up with the the, the motorway verge which also had some trees on it uh, so that was good because that not only creates woodland habitat but you've got the carbon offsets aspect of that uh, the wetland creation is this kind of bluey stuff in the middle and down at the bottom this is good not just because you're creating nice habitats so again you get biodiversity enhancement and those, the credits, the biodiversity units that come from that, but also there are additional benefits from reducing flood downstream, increase, improving water quality in the stream, which goes down the left of the site down there. So you're holding back water and releasing it slow, more slowly so that that water is going to be better. Um, and bear in mind, of course, you're taking this out of production, so you're no longer putting fertilizers on all of this land. So that's going to be good for the water course as well. And also habitats like wetland are really good for carbon. So there are various different benefits you can get. And then you've got um, species rich grassland, uh, which is quite easy to create. So that's again scores quite nicely on the metric, quite low maintenance as well. And then these bits, the wildflower meadows are 
uh, closer to the buildings. It is uh, costs a bit more to create, but you're creating something that's really nice for for the local people to to gaze upon. So you get those sorts of added benefits as well. So you get these additional benefits. So you get you get the idea. Right. Very quickly, hurtle through a couple of um, case studies. So this is a site. Um, uh, uh, some contaminated lagoons in Derbyshire. Uh, so you can see that's what it looked like on the left beforehand. This sort of brown field mosaic, might expect. And on the right is the kind of the capped end version. So that was after it was remediated. So this is in uh, near Chesterfield. Um, you had some lagoons that were receiving kind of contaminated runoff from the from the from the, from the ground, from the neighbouring land. But as you can see from the top drawing, uh, the um, the habitat mosaics were, were quite good. So you had quite a lot of scrub and grass and the wetland and all sorts of nice stuff. And then weirdly, you know, afterwards, it, it looked rather awful because you'd lost the heterogeneity and you've just got grassland. So they that's what happened because th this was mainly for public and amenity use. It was just so people could walk their dogs or whatever and to protect the water environment. So that was the, the focus of this, this project. And it ended up with a nice kind of grassland that people could walk through. And it was all filled in, basically, the big, that big void was filled in and it was landscaped and it was restored back to, to grassland. Now, because this was back in 2008, biodiversity net gain wasn't heard of, let alone being a prime driver. But ecology was considered um, in the design. But it is worth saying that now the Environment Act has, has come in, the BNG definitely will be an issue. You really will need to work out what your end use is going to be and whether there's likely to be a, a net gain. And from those drawings, you might anticipate that there wouldn't be a net gain. However, that's not quite how it panned out, funnily enough. So the positives of this were that we did do some stuff for protected species, I think newts and badgers and various other things. So that, that was dealt with separately. Um, the, the contaminants were remediated properly, the pollution was dealt with. It's now a great place to walk um, for local people. So all these sorts of great things happened. And kind of by chance, a, a large area of flower rich grassland was created. And that was really because you had some nice grassland retained around the outside. And they didn't topsoil this, they, they used, not deliberately, but they used soil that wasn't so great, which meant it actually took the, the wildflower seed really quite well. And it turned into a really quite speech rich um, sward. The negatives were that we did lose that habitat diversity and that heterogeneity from the top map you saw. So the, the woodland, the scrub and wetland had gone. But actually, weirdly, when we retrospectively ran this through the DEFRA metric, it did actually lead to a net gain. And that's because species rich neutral grassland does score really well in the metric. So even if it's just wall to wall species rich grassland, that's not such a bad thing. So even though we got by chance a good result on this project, you do now need to understand these BNG issues up front. So you need to plan what the end uh, land use is going to be. You need to design it, you plow that into the metric and work out whether or not you're going to get net gain. In this case, it was kind of like fortuitous that we did. That's what the output from the net from the uh, DEFRA metric looks like. So your on-site baseline was 63.53 uh, habitat units. There wasn't any hedgerow or river units. And Post intervention, it was 70. So that was an increase of 10.64%. So it was a greater than 10% net gain, kind of by chance. Right, what time is it? Five past. Um, okay, so if we were remediating the site, we'd definitely use the metric. Um, you'd, you'd certainly want to weigh up the pros and cons of whether you want to develop. You know, how much would it cost to do the remediation? How much would it cost to buy offsets, potentially, if that was needed? Um, obviously, if you're building on this, you wouldn't end up with all that lovely species rich grass because it'd have houses on it. And so you do need to have this balancing act between uh, between development and, and, and the BNG. So if development wasn't appropriate on this particular land, uh, you'd want to optimize the value of the land by biodiversity and carbon offsetting. Maybe you could put some renewables on there. Uh, public recreation would be a good thing, as they did on this site, or you could even return it to agriculture. There are various things that you can, you, you know, you can decide the end use will be. But it is, it's just really important to plan ahead and work out in the light of BNG, which will be a cost to developers, um, but also in the light of other opportunities for other natural capital income and also renewables, all of these things get weighed in. I'm not going to go through this 
next one because it would be nice to have some questions. So in conclusion, government policy still seems to guide us towards building on brownfield over greenfield, which is a bit annoying. But as I think I've demonstrated in biodiversity and natural capital terms, that isn't always the sensible option. Delivering BNG on some of these sites can be really challenging, um, especially if you know it's developed over, over time into a really nice site. So we do really need to understand what the baseline is uh, and really see that as potentially, yeah, potentially a constraint to development, but also an opportunity if development isn't the end use of that land. Uh, and where housing or employment isn't an option, then this kind of natural capital approach where you could potentially get income from various different things, such as offsetting or renewables or the use of public green space, that's, you know, that's, that's, worth, uh, that's worth looking at, I think. Right. Okay, I shall stop sharing. Um, and hopefully that's time for some questions. I'm hoping everyone's still there. You could have all gone to the pub for all I know. Amazing. Thank you so much, John. That was a really interesting presentation. And we've got lots and lots of questions coming through. So I'll pick straight off um, okay. with some of those. So if there is a price by unit for off-site mm -hmm. biodiversity net gain, does that set a cap for comparison for on-site remediation? For example, if it's cheaper to buy units off-site, um, does that risk clients not pursuing remediation on? Very good question. Uh, th there's an interesting debate going on about this because what has been found is that on-site habitat creation, retention or whatever, um, often leads to rather itty bitty little scraps of habitat that don't really get looked after very well. And people commit to creating nice habitat and it doesn't really happen. And what has been found is that if you actually buy offsets somewhere else, which are maybe part of a much bigger scheme, a landscape scale approach to creating habitat at big scale, then the benefits are greater. Uh, so that works in my favour because that's what we're trying to do is create big habitat banks where we can sell units. Ultimately, I think there'll be a blend for each site. You, you might want, well want to create retain some habitats on, on a site because you've got nice areas for you know, residents to look at, for example. But it, it's a balancing act between having to pay off site and having to do stuff on site. Bear in mind that if you are doing stuff on site, you are sacrificing land that you might be able to develop, which could bring that that could bring in more income than than the biodiversity. So it is a real balancing act. And I think if if the market becomes quite competitive and buying biodiversity units is is relatively cheap, then developers will probably get the most out of their land and build on most of it if they can. And I don't think that's necessarily a disaster, to be honest. That makes sense. Thanks, John. Um and who polices or audits biodiversity net gain or offsetting activities for developers? What happens if so offsetting habitat development fails for whatever reason? Yeah, can I just answer that question actually that was just put in the chat? Of um, course. Was it, sorry, because it was in response to that last thing. Oh, I can't see it anymore. Anyway, I think it was about the fact that uh, local authorities are asking for on-site in, in nearly all cases. Yes, I think I think people, the reason local authorities want to retain habitat on site is because they want to retain biodiversity within their local authority. There's this risk that all of their biodiversity gets trashed and the developer pays someone, you know, 100 miles away to create biodiversity, which is sort of exporting biodiversity out of your local authority, if you like. So I think that's why, why local authorities are doing that. But um, I think it will be a mix, as I say, I think, I, th I think there will be you won't be able to, to create to retain it'd be rare to, to create to be able to have 10 percent net gain on on sites i think sorry what was the other question um this one's about who polices or audits oh, either yeah. net gain or yeah. so we don't know yet um this is kind of the massive elephant in the room so we're, we're responding to the defra consultation on the environment act at the minute and one of the key things for us is that they're you know the government i don't want to get too political but they've rather drained money out of local services and out of local authorities and out of natural england natural england and the local authority ecologists are the obvious people who would police this the 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 register of offsets is going to be banked with the local authorities so they will be responsible for these biodiversity offsetting sites uh, and so they should therefore be validating them and saying yes we think you can create this habitat and please send us a report every five years to show us that it's progressing in the right direction 
but there but there needs to be a massive injection of funds into this in my opinion because you can't just have regulation without people there to regulate it so it's that that's you know that is quite important and natural england i think will probably have some some sort of role in this because they you know they will need to validate and say yes we think that this design where you're proposing to create lots of I don't know heathland and lowland meadow whatever will work so it's probably a combination of the two but it's absolutely not established yet we, we, it's up in the air completely good question Great, thank you um and will new remediation planning applications require 10 percent net gain and can therefore any credits generated beyond the 10 percent be sold to market per offsite site yeah absolutely and that's what i encourage people to do um the downside of this, and again, this came out through the DEFRA consultation, is that it's sort of, if, if you say that, it's encouraging people to only achieve 10% net gain on site and everything else they can then sell, if you see what I mean. Um, so if you didn't have that opportunity, then people might create 15% on site because it's kind of the right thing to do. Uh, so it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a bit difficult to see how this will this will this will work but i do think that is the way it's going to go and that if you have enough land to create more biodiversity than you need then it would make sense for a developer with a reasonable amount of land to create a habitat bank which they can then use either to offset their own impacts from other developments nearby which we call insetting so you're doing biodiversity offsetting on your own land or indeed you can sell biodiversity credits to other developers and it's you know it'll be a way of making this these developments viable so i don't really have a problem with it great thank you um and what scope do you think there is for local plans and neighborhood plans to include requirements such as this uh well local plans are derived through the local planning authority so they will be they will be asking for this um neighborhood plans i don't think they really uh, carry enough weight in statutory terms to to impose that necessarily it's kind of up to them they can they can try it but you know neighborhood plans don't really have an awful lot of teeth i don't think um, but local plans definitely you know i'm working with uh, lancaster council on on an offsetting a, a net gain thing because they've got policy that that says we want net gain with all development so they can they can enforce it and they will Great. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I'm so sorry. We haven't had time to go through all of the questions. We've had so many come in, um, but really appreciate uh, your presentation, John. It was really interesting and obviously an area of great interest, judging by the response. Um, Bethany, do you want to just ping me the questions after this and I'll, I'll see if I can very quickly respond to some of them so that people get them? That would be amazing. Thank you. And any responses that you give, we'll put on the website along with your recording. So that would be amazing. Thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone watching today. It's really great to see so many of you here. I really hope you found that um, beneficial and informative. Um, just to let you know that the next IES webinar um, is at the same time tomorrow and is on chemical and environmental hazards and introduction to the UK Health Security Agency's operational work and research. A massive thank you once again to John and thanks to all of you for coming. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Yes,